ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله ايها الناس عباد الله لقد روى الترمذي وغيره من حديث ابن عباس رضي الله عنه ان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال له وهو غلام it is reported by Tirmidhi, Ahmed and others from the hadith of Ibn Abbas that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said to Ibn Abbas while he was a young child Ya Ghulam, Ihfadillah O young boy, preserve the boundaries of Allah Ihfadillah, Yahfadk If you preserve the boundaries of Allah, Allah he will preserve you Ihfadillah, Tajidhu Tujahak Preserve Allah's boundaries and you will find Allah Azza wa Jal's aid in front of you. إِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ If you seek aid, then seek the aid of Allah. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ And if you ask, then only ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ لَوْ اجْتَمَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفَعُوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَنْفَعُوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكْ Know that if this whole ummah was to unite, to benefit you with the slightest thing, they would not benefit you except with what Allah Jalla wa ala had written. For it to come to you. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ اجْتَمَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَذُرُّوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَذُرُّوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ And if this nation was to unite, to harm you in the slightest way, they would never be able to do so, except with what Allah had already written against you. رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامِ وَجَفَّتِ الصُّحُفِ The pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. And this hadith, it shows us a matter of importance in the creed of the Muslim, that we know whatever touches us and whatever reaches us in this worldly life, then this is something that Allah he had written for it to come our way. And this is similar to the hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَمَا أَخْطَأَكْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يصيبك. Whatever passes you was never meant to strike you. وَمَا أَصَابَكْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يخطئك. And whatever touches us, it was never meant to pass us. This is... The belief in the Qadr, the divine decree of Allah Jalla wa Ala, which is from the pillars of Iman, that every single believer should have in his Iman, the belief in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that anything that comes to us from good or evil, then this is what Allah Jalla wa Ala had written before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And when Jibreel, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the form of a man, and he began to ask him questions in the... Known hadith that many of the children even memorize. The hadith which is known as the hadith of Jibreel. When he began to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about iman, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded by saying, أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر وأن تؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره It is for you to believe in Allah, to believe in His angels and His books and His prophets, to believe in the last day and to believe in the qadr of Allah, the good of it, and the bad of it. So this is an essential pillar, a fundamental foundation in the belief of a Muslim that we must believe in this qadr, that nothing is happening in this world today or has ever happened or will ever happen except that Allah Jalla wa Ala, He knew of it. As His knowledge is a knowledge which has no boundaries and cannot be encompassed. Allah's Jalla, Allah Jalla wa Ala, His knowledge is of that which occurs, of that which will occur. And even of the matters that if 
they were to occur. Allah Jalla wa'ala knows how they will to occur. This is the depth of Allah Azza wa Jal's ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us about a people who enter the hellfire. They ask Allah to be returned to the worldly life, to, good, to do good deeds that they left behind. Allah Jalla wa'ala, He tells us in the Noble Quran, بَلْ بَدَى لَهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يُخْفُونَ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَلَوْ رُدُّوا لَعَادُوا لِمَا نُهُ عَنْهِ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ If they were to be returned, they would go back to those evil things that they were doing. وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ And indeed they are liars. So this matter is a matter that will never happen. When a person dies, his book is closed and his deeds stop, except for what has come in the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the actions cease and a person can never return back. But Allah Jalla wa'ala, He still informs us that if these people were to return back to this worldly life, they would go back to doing the same things that Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited them from. So Allah Azza wa Jal's knowledge is a knowledge which encompasses everything, the beginning and the end. Jalla fi ula. And this is from the maratib, the pillars which are in the qadr of Allah as you believe in them as a believer. That Allah, He knew everything. And that Allah, He wrote everything. This is the second pillar in your belief in the divine decree of Allah. That Allah Jalla wa He commanded for everything to be written. As it comes in the hadith, fi sunan, أول ما خلق الله القلم قال له اكتب When Allah Azza wa created the pen He told the pen to write قال ما أكتب The pen said to Allah What should I write? Allah Jalla wa ala said اكتب كل ما هو كائن Write everything that will occur So the pen began to write And this is another pillar From the pillars of the decree of Allah Jalla wa ala That Allah He commanded everything to be written And Allah Azza wa Jal He mentions to us in the Noble Quran ما أصاب من مصيبة فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ بْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ There is not a fear or calamity that strikes in this worldly life. There is nothing that happens. Nothing. Except that Allah tells us it was in a book before we brought it into existence. إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ This is a matter which is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Easy for Him. That everything that will happen is written plain in a book. So this is a second fundamental pillar in the pillars of the divine decree of Allah Jalla wa'ala. The third of these pillars, that Allah Azza wa Jal, He wished and willed for everything that happened for it to occur. There is nothing that happens except that it is through the Mashia and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing that can happen in this dunya from good or bad except that Allah Azza wa Jal willed for it to happen. And Allah's will, it does not necessitate in any way that Allah Azza wa Jal, He loves it. This is what is referred to as al mashia and the ulama also define it as being al irad al kuniya the general existence of everything in the worldly life, from good and evil, then this is something which returns back to this mashia And the good things and the good deeds, this is that which Allah Azza wa Jalla loves. But a person doing something haram or something evil happening, it is just from his decision and his will for it to happen, for a hikmah and a wisdom that he subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we may not know. فالله عز وجل يعلم ونحن لا نعلم. For Allah He knows, but we do not know. So there's nothing that happens in this worldly life except that it is through Allah عز وجل's will and His wish for it to occur. This is a third pillar that the ulama mention. That is from the pillars of the divine decree of Allah جل وعلا. The fourth and final pillar that they mention is that Allah عز وجل He created everything, everything from the makhlukat, every created being, every created thing. Then this is through Allah سبحانه وتعالى's creation and bringing it into the existence. So these are the pillars of the divine decree with Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Al ilm, knowledge, wal kitabah, that Allah he commanded for it to be written, wal mashi'ah, that Allah Azza wa Jal willed for these things to happen. Wa Allah Azza wa Jal, he also brought them into existence, which is the khalq. This is something which is fundamental for us to hold on to in our creed, in the divine decree. And if we understand the divine decree correctly, then they will not come to us, bi Azza wa Jal, any doubts as to why people are being punished in the hereafter. Allah's divine decree and His wisdom of what would happen in this worldly life does not necessitate in the slightest portion that Allah Azza wa Jal compel them or oppress them or overcame them and overwhelm them to doing the deeds that they do. إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَتُمْ فَلَهَا If you do good, then you are doing it for your own self. And if you do evil, then you are doing it against your own self. It is Allah Azza wa Jal, He knows that you will do this and He has written it against you. And Allah, He knew that you would do the good and He wrote it for you. But it is nothing of compulsion or Allah Azza wa Jal pushing the slave into the action. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He tells us in the Hadith Qudsi, which is in Muslim, Ya Ibn Adam, إِنَّمَا هِيَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ أُحْسِيهَا لَكُمْ ثُمَّ أُوَفِّكُمْ إِيَاهَا 
O oh, son of Adam, they are your deeds. I merely count them for you, enumerate them for you, and then I give them to you in full. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Whoever finds good, then let him be thankful to Allah. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكْ فَلَا يَلُمَّنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ And the one who finds other than good, then don't blame except yourself. Don't blame except your own soul. You can't even blame the shaitan as he will come on the day of judgment saying to the people that all he did was whisper in the ayat in Surah Ibrahim. دعوتكم فاستجبتم لي فلا تلوموني ولوموا أنفسكم ما أنا بمسرخكم وما أنتم بمسرخي He says the shaitan on the day of judgment All I did was whisper and call you and you were the one who answered I had no power over you So don't blame me but blame yourselves Don't call for my help in the hellfire and I'm not gonna call for your help What a wicked and vile person he is then The one who the shaitan overcomes him And causes him to be cast into the hellfire We have no one to blame But our own souls We have no one to blame But the deficiency in ourselves Not Allah Azza wa Jal's qadr And his divine decree So a person remains upon sins For years and years And he says This is through the qadr of Allah Allah he has decreed this for me La This is not a correct understanding of the qadr of Allah This is actually a futile And wrongful understanding it's actually an ascription of oppression to Allah. The one who does haram throughout his life. And then he comes and says, this is through Allah's decree that I am doing this. Then Allah is punishing you on top of that. So this means Allah, He is forcing you to do something and then punishing you for it. What more oppression is there? What more oppression is there? Wallahu Azza wa Jal qad harrama dhulma ala nafsi. And Allah Jalla wa ala, as it comes in Muslim also, that He made haram dhulm upon Himself. He has made oppression haram upon himself as it comes in the hadith inni haramtu dhulm ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadhalamu i have made dhulm haram upon myself and i have made it with amongst you o mankind and o jinn i have made it also something which is haram fala tadhalamu so do not oppress one another and this is from ascribing to allah azza wa jalla oppression that you are doing this haram and you're holding on to the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal and making it an excuse for the reason that you are doing what you are doing. They say the first one, the first of the creation of Allah, الذي احتج بالقدر, that he held on to the qadr of Allah and tried to make it a reason for the sin that he did was Iblis al lain was a shaitan al rajim when Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to prostrate and he refused to prostrate. Then he turned back to Allah Jalla wa ala and he said, Rabbi bima aghwaytani la'aqudanna lahum sirataka al-mustaqeem. Oh Allah, because you misguided me, I will sit for them upon your straight path. So he used the qadr of Allah. You misguided me, but he didn't see his own retaliation and resistance and disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jal and ascribing to Allah oppression. Because the reason, as some of the ulama mentioned, that Iblis fell into kufr and disbelief was that he ascribed to Allah oppression and injustice. How is this? This is because when Allah he commanded him to prostrate to Adam and he turned back to Allah and he's saying خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين You created me from fire and you created him from, from the earth, from mud. He felt as if he was being humiliated and he was being made base by Allah Azza wa Jal. This is where the dhulm he's ascribing to Allah Azza wa Jal and this is from the kufr that he fell into. وَالْعِيَضُ بِاللَّهِ And you find many, some of us maybe from the Muslims who are afflicted with these ideologies and these wasawis that Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed for me. La, this is not the correct belief. And it's not also the correct belief to not believe in it entirely and say there is no qadr. جَاءَ فِي مُسْلِمْ مِنْ حَدِيثِ إِبْنْ عُمَرْ وَيَرْوِ الْحَدِيثِ عَنَ بِهِ عُمَرِ بِنَ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ It is reported in Muslim, the first hadith, which Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he reports from his father Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. And in this hadith, there is a hikaya and a qissa and a narrative which is in it that two men, they came to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who were Yahya ibn Ya'mur, who Humayd ibn Abdul Rahman al-Himyari, jau ila Ibn Umar, or jau ila, ila Mecca, hajain, or mu'tamirain. They came to Mecca to perform hajj or umrah. And they wished to meet a companion from the companions of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they may ask him of what had occurred in their land in Basra. As they were from the region of Iraq. So he said, فَوُفِقْنَا لِبِنْ عُمَرْ وَهُوَ يَدْخُلُ الْمَسْجِدِ We were granted success to meet Ibn Umar while he was entering the masjid. So you see where the awliya of Allah are. They're in the houses of Allah coming to the masajid to establish the salah. This is where they found Ibn Umar. And he was entering the masjid. And Abdurrahman or Humayd ibn Abdurrahman, he said, I thought that my companion, he would lead me to, leave me to talk. So they stood on either side of Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, and after the prayer, he began to speak to him, saying, ظَهَرَ مِنْ قِبَلِنَا أُنَاسٌ أُنَاسٌ يَقُولُونَ لَا قَدْرٌ وَأَنَّ الْأَمْرُ أُنُفٌ 
There's a people who came from our region of the land and they say, there's no qadr. There's no qadr of Allah. And this matter that occurs in this worldly life, it is unuf. يعني مستعنف, it is something which begins. That Allah Azza wa Jal does not know of an action until the action occurs in this dunya. Allah, He does not know of anything until it occurs in this worldly life. Kufrun bawah, clear disbelief in Allah Jalla wa ala. And there are Muslims claiming Islam for themselves rather. They are claiming it for themselves. And in this narration, these people who came from that region, they said to Ibn Umar, يتقفرون العلم ويقرؤون القرآن They recite the Quran and they chase after acquiring knowledge. So it is not a person that you are fooled by that merely because he's chasing after knowledge, he's chasing after the ilm, or that he recites the Quran in a beautiful way, and they have a beautiful recitation, that this is sufficient for you to submit to everything that they are telling you. So these people went to a person of knowledge, and this is what you should do, a person of sunnah, a person of the correct aqidah, a person upon the tawheed of Allah Azza wa and ask them the questions that you are seeking in your religion, and not open your ears to every Tom, Dick and Harry who speaks about the religion of Allah Azza wa ilm. So when they spoke to Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar he told the, those two people who came, those two tabi'een, he said, أخبرهم, tell them, أني منهم بريء, وأنهم مني براء, tell them, I am free from them, and they are free from me. ولو أن أحدهم أنفق مثل أحد ذهب ما قبل منه حتى يؤمن بالقدر. If one of them was to give the mountain of Uhud in gold as sadaqah, it would never be accepted from him until he believes in the qadr of Allah. And this was a point that he narrated the hadith of his father, the one that we took previously, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned from the pillars of the divine decree of Allah azza wa jal, is to believe in the qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. Ma'ashir al-Muslimin. So this is an essential part in the life of the believer, to believe in the qadr of Allah, and to know that there is nothing that will strike you, and nothing that will afflict you in this worldly life, except that Allah He has written, for it to come your way, as a test for you, as a imtihan, as for Allah Azza wa to make known, those who are truthful, from those who are liars, in their claim of iman, as Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, Alif la meem, ahasib an nas an yutraku, an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun, do the people perceive, that they will say, we believe and they will not be tested, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ And Allah Azza wa Jalla will make known the one who is truthful from the one who is a liar. So these are tests that come to us for this purpose. And from these tests that come to mankind are the spiritual tests, the tests in a person's iman, where a person may be afflicted by sihr, they may be afflicted by black magic, magic and witchcraft, they may be afflicted by ayn, evil eye, they may be afflicted with the things of this sort, where a person is in need of ruqya, he is in need of the recitation of the Qur'an, and the supplications which have come in the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the beautiful and authentic supplications, which are a means for the treatment of these illnesses. As these illnesses do not come to us, except by Allah Azza wa Jal's decree for them to reach us. And the believer in Allah Azza wa Jal, before reaching out to conventional medications and the different Aspirins and different medications which are there. First and foremostly, our route should be to turn to Allah for help. To turn for, to Allah Azza wa Jal for His aid in the situation that we are facing. For indeed, it is Allah Azza wa Jal who cures the illnesses. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is reported from him several ahadith. Several ahadith where he would recite on the person as it comes in the hadith of Aisha, fi sahihain and also the hadith of Anas, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, Allahumma rabban nas, adhib al-ba's, ishfi wa anta shafi, la shifa'a illa shifa'uk, shifa'an la yugadiru al-saqama. Rabban nas, the Lord of mankind, adhib al-ba's, take away the illness, cure, and you are the only one who cures. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would rub the place. And also from the supplications, is what is found in the hadith of Aisha, also in Bukhari, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would put his hand into a saliva which he placed on the earth, and he would say, Bismillahi turbatu ardina, wariqatu ba'dina, yushfa saqimuna, bi'idhni rabbina. He would say, by the name of Allah, and a portion of the earth, and he would take a portion of it, some of the ruwat, those who report the hadith mentioned, and then he would put it on the person where there was a wound, or where he was ailing from on his body, and he would tell him, reciting the supplication to him, Bismillah in the name of Allah, وَتُرْبَةُ أَرْضِنَا And a portion of the earth, يُشْفَى سَقِيمُنَا The one who is sick from amongst us is cured, بِإِذْنِ رَبِّنَا By the will of Allah Jalla wa Ala. So this was another supplication that he would make sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also it comes in the hadith of Aisha fi sahihain that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would place his hands together and he would spit in them lightly 
And he would begin to read the mu'awidhat. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. And qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. And qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. And then he would wipe his body. He would wipe his body. So these are methods. Wal Qur'anu kulluhu shifa. And the entire Qur'an is a shifa and it is a treatment and a cure. Wa nunazzilu min al-Qur'ani ma huwa shifa'un wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. Wa la yazidu al-zalimina illa khasara. Allah Jalla wa Ala, he says, and we send down from the Qur'an that which a treatment and a healing for the believers, and it does not increase those who are exp- oppressive, those who are wrongdoers, except in khasara, in loss. So these are ways for us to treat ourselves. Recite the Qur'an, recite upon yourself the Fatiha, as Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu did, and the narration which is in Bukhari and Muslim, when he read upon that man, the chief of that tribe of people from the Arab, who was ailing from the bite of a scorpion or a snake, and he began to recite upon him the Fatiha, until the man became cured. And when they returned back to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told them, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ أَنَّهَا الرُّقِيَ What made you know that this is the Ruqya? And he took a portion of the goats and sheep that were brought back to them as a compensation for the recitation of the Ruqya. مَعَشِرَ muslimin. The point from this is for us to know two main things. The matter of the divine decree of Allah Azza wa Jal and the aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah with regard to this matter. And for us to know that these illnesses, whether it's black magic or whether it is some form of witchcraft or evil eye, or other than this, that these are from the illnesses that Allah Azza wa Jalla tests mankind with. Have we not paid attention to Surah Al-Baqarah? When Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَطْلُوا الشَّيْطِينَ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ السُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيْطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِلَ هَارُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ The point being, from this ayah which is quite lengthy, that Allah Azza wa Jal, He sent the two angels, Harut and Marut, to test the people with magic. So this is a test from Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is a correct stance with regard to Harut and Marut, that they were angels as a test from Allah Azza wa Jal, for mankind, as to see who would believe from those who would disbelieve, for it's not befitting that a devil, he comes and he says, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ A devil wishing for mankind to enter the hellfire. And then he says, we're nothing more than a test. We're nothing more than a test. Don't disbelieve. Rather the devil pushes. كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ اكْفُرُ فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِئٌ مِّنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ His example is the example of the shaytan who says to mankind, disbelieve. And then when you disbelieve, he says, I'm free from you. I fear Allah, the Lord of all that exists. So the shaitan, he pushes us into disbelief. As for this ayah, it indicates that they were saying, we're nothing more than a test. So do not disbelieve, which strengthens the opinion, which is the correct opinion amongst Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that they were angels and they were not devils. We ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to keep us safe from the sihr, and to keep us safe from the ayn, and to keep us safe from every illness, which keeps us far away from him Jalla wa'ala, walhamdulillah. الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أيها الناس We have taken some matters of importance with regard to the correct creed as well as the test that Allah Azza wa Jal He puts us through as believers And this is for a hikmah like we mentioned a wisdom as Allah's actions they are built upon wisdom and Allah Azza wa Jal does not oppress his slaves. And Ma'ashir al Muslimin, these illnesses that afflict us and we are tested with our relatives and friends, we find that we are quickly rushing to treatment without going back and attempting to treat ourselves. Your best Raqi, the best one who can treat you is yourself, bi'idhni Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is important for us to mention this because we find ourselves when afflicted with illness, we are running back immediately to other people in order for them to do ruqya on us, in order for them to treat us, and we're saying it's not going to be accepted or we don't know what we're doing. This is a shortcoming and a flaw on our behalf. But if we're firm in our religion, and we say we're firm in our religion, meaning that we're fulfilling Allah Azza wa obligations, then we would be treated bi idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah Azza wa has made this a means and a reason for treatment. But a person who's not praying their salawat, or missing out their salawat, or doing haram, or drinking alcohol, or partying and doing what they want in the worldly life, then they're afflicted, and they want to do ruqya or seek ruqya. How is it that you are going to be treated, and you are yourself not holding your bargain with Allah Azza wa Jal, in terms of fulfilling what He wants from you as a slave? So the first way is to look at yourself, or look at this friend and relative who is afflicted with this, and remind them to fear Allah, and return back to Allah. 
This could, this could be this test that they're afflicted with something that Allah Azza wa Jal wishes to return them back to the right way because of. وَلَنُذِيقَنَّهُمْ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ الْأَدْنَى دُونَ الْعَذَابِ الْأَكْبَرِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ Allah he says, and we may cause them to taste this lesser punishment before the greater punishment so they may come back. So it is possible that Allah he wishes for us to return back from what we are doing so he tests us in this way. So look at yourself and where you are in the religion of Allah and strive in doing these ibadat. And if you are upright in his religion, bi-idhnillah, this will be a reason for the cure of Allah to come to you. Once we were in, when we were in Yemen, a man who was reciting upon another man in front of us who we thought was afflicted by sihr for a time period which maybe exceeded an hour or was near that. And nothing became apparent from him except maybe slight jittering of limbs. Then he gave us an advice and he told us about a woman who he recited on behind, behind a veil. He recited on this woman. Then the jinn, this shaitan began to speak and he said, you read on me one hour, two hours, three, I can be patient. I will take the burning and be patient. But this woman, she's praying consistently and she's making dua against me in the sujood for half an hour. I can't bear this anymore. Look at the power in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which punished this devil more than the recitation was this woman's behavior and her closeness to Allah jalla wa'ala. So if we're close to him, bi-idhnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will be a means for the treatment. And we're mentioning this as that which is Mentioned in the social media, as many of you know, from people who are not even Muslim or pretend to be Muslim, doing ruqya and trying to gain the people's wealth. Many of the ulama mention, such as Ibn Taymiyyah, Nawi and others, that a person is permit- permissible for them to take a ja'ala, to take a compensation for the ruqya that they do. Based upon this hadith of Abi Sa'id, radiallahu anhu, they took a portion of goats and sheep for the ruqya that they did. So this is something which is permitted. But they also mention, some of them, that this is with the condition that the treatment happens. A person setting rules and regulations with you and saying to you, I will not recite until you give me 300 or 200 or 100 or even 20 pounds. What treatment has happened and what have you cured me of for me to give you this wealth? You are taking wealth without any right. And this is what is happening in the ummah. Mustaghilun, people who are using the nation of Islam for their own gains and benefits, for their own financial profit. And this is something which they will be asked about in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. Another matter of importance is the permissibility of a kafir, a disbeliever, doing ruqya upon a Muslim. Is this permissible? A Shafi'i rahimahullah, Imam al quotes from him in Sahih Muslim, his explanation that it is permissible for a disbeliever to read upon the believer as long as it is the Qur'an, meaning and the authentic supplications which are found. So this is something which is permitted. And we came across a chain of narration which is reported by Imam Malik in his Muwatta. That Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his daughter Aisha radiallahu anha, there was a Jewish woman reciting upon her and doing ruqya. And he said, there's no harm in this if this is by way of the book of Allah. So this is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the most knowledgeable of this ummah, saying there's no harm in this if this is by way of the book of Allah. So this is not something we're debating. But what we're debating is for a person to pretend to be Muslim and come and recite, this is the deception and this is the nifaq that the person is doing. So let not one come and try to hide around these statements of the ulama and try to claim for themselves that they were doing something which is permitted. There is ghash wal khiyana which is there. So be wary for a Muslim and know that the shifa which is in the Quran and the shifa which is in the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa this cure, it's not restricted to anyone. Be upright on the path of Allah and follow Allah's commandments and do the khayrat and recite upon yourselves men and women. And if there's a need to go to someone who is righteous, then there's no harm in this requesting for a person to do ruqya, but we mention also as a benefit as it comes in the hadith of Ibn Abbas in Bukhari Muslim that if a person is to request from another ruqya, then the hadith of Ibn Abbas indicates that this person will be removed from the 70,000 people who come on the Day of Judgment. لَيْسَ لَهُمْ حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَذَابٌ They will not have any recompense, nor will they be punished. When the Sahaba asked him, who are these people, these 70,000? He said, لَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ وَلَا يَتَطَيَّرُونَ وَلَا يَكْتَوُونَ وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ They do not ask for ruqya, nor do they castrize themselves using fire as a means of treatment. وَلَا يَتَطَيَّرُونَ Nor do they have superstitious beliefs. وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And they depend upon Allah Azza wa Jal with their hearts and truth. We ask Allah Jalla wa Ala to make us from this category of people and to benefit us by what we have heard and to rid the ummah of these Dajjaleen, these Kadhabeen, these Munafiqeen who are using the nation of Islam and its people for their own benefits and gains. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.